Hello friends, welcome to CEC Live Lectures, dear friends, with the ongoing series on Indian literature in English translation. Today we are going to talk on realism in Malayalam fiction. And for the discussion on the topic, we have with us in our studios Professor Anand Prakash. Professor Anand Prakash is a retired professor of uh, English from uh, Delhi University, uh, who continuously and persists persistently makes efforts so that uh, the subject called English becomes easier for you all. We always uh, get uh, in-depth knowledge on the various topics uh, through him and uh, we are uh, blessed to have him every time in the studio. So, let us welcome our guest Professor Anand Prakash once again and I would request Professor Prakash to give us uh, the better insight into today's topic once again. Anand sir, welcome to me sir. Thanks Geetika <coughs> for your very kind and generous words uh, and welcome friends. Uh, today's topic as has been announced uh, is uh, Realism in Malayalam fiction. Uh, about realism, we have discussed things earlier, and uh, Malayalam fiction is something new for us. But uh, <coughs> let me tell you that uh, this is a series uh, which uh, caters to the uh, student today uh, for the needs you know that uh, one has to understand uh, uh, lit cultural literary things in India in English translation. And in this series, we have uh, already <coughs> now done a large number of lectures uh, that relate to our different languages in India, the literature uh, produced there and uh, the rendering uh, in English translation because our approach to uh, these different literature literatures is through English. Uh, <coughs> today's topic being uh, Malayalam fiction, uh, let me uh, say a few general things about uh, the southern part of India, its cultures, its languages. Uh, just by way of uh, you know connecting with uh, the Malayalam fiction. Uh, the first thing that I say, <coughs> which has been uh, also uh, pointed out earlier in the series uh, by different speakers including me, is that uh, there is a question before us uh, regarding you know uh, the nature and character of India. And uh, most of us rightly say that India is a country, it is a nation, uh, it is a vibrant nation, it is a nation of multiplicities. But at the same time, there are others, and uh, th uh, there's no quarrel with that. Uh, people believe that India is not just a country; it's a subcontinent. Uh, what are the implications of India being a country or a subcontinent? Uh, you have to go into it. You have to guess. You have to think about. So far as I'm concerned, India is of uh, a country of vastness, and it's a country of variety. And uh, if it is vast and various in its nature. Uh, in, in its character, uh, in its various cultures, then this is to be kept in mind. Uh, for instance, uh, <coughs> the southern part of India is somewhat uh, separated by mountain range and uh, on this side of Vindhya, on that side of Vindhya, that is how you know the historians and sociologists uh, refer to the totality of India. And uh, <coughs> uh, I, I really uh, believe you know that uh, uh, there is difference. Uh, between uh, the two parts of India uh, regarding languages for instance and there are four languages, four major languages in southern part of India and uh, these uh, languages have a distinctness of their own they, and they have idioms, and they have expressions, uh, they, they have you know uh, words uh, which denote a different kind of atmosphere and uh, that in fact enriches the, the understanding of India with respect to its culture because if we have a set of languages in North India, in Western India or in Eastern India, then those cultures, those languages which are spoken here uh, with the variety of uh, vocabulary, uh, these things are enriched when we have another set of languages, cultures, uh, vocabulary elsewhere like in South India. And uh, <coughs> languages do not remain in a vacuum. Cultures do not remain in a vacuum. All these things get connected with uh, actual concrete life processes. And uh, therefore, uh, we say that uh, uh, the four languages that we have in South India, they should be, uh, you know, read with great interest and, 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 and great, you know, curiosity because they tell us about a world, about a dream world, about a world which, which caters also to imagination in such a manner that we start sometimes right, rightly, looking at ourselves from that angle and that gives us a new perspective. 
So, uh, <coughs> so far as Malayalam is concerned, this is the language that is spoken in Kerala, uh, which is on the eastern side of, of, the, of the southern India. And uh, uh, it has uh, 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 a landscape, it, it has a sea, uh, it, it has uh, valleys, it has also mountains in it. And these things, you know, offer to us, uh, you know, a range of, 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 of uh, life, uh, a range of, you know, human social activities uh, that uh, have to be, uh, you know, seen, of course, directly, but also seen through the prism of Malayalam writing. And Malayalam writing is uh, by, by, by uh, you know, no, no stretch of imagination, be, uh, you know, a simple kind of a thing. It's a thing that offers challenges. It is very inspiring. And the more we uh, know about, uh, you know, Malayalam language and its range, the better uh, we'll, you know, uh, behave in our own cultures and languages with respect to uh, society, with respect to its, uh, you know, requirements and all the associated things. So, uh, <coughs> cultures and cu culture and cultures of South India, even within Kerala, there might be different, you know, strain, uh, strains and streams of culture. Or uh, there might be cultures, you know, uh, in, the, in the cities, and the cities are open not merely to the rest of the, you know, uh, life process there, but also to the world outside. So you have the cities, you, you have small towns, and you also have villages. And uh, there is a lot of water. There, there, there is a different kind of, you know. Uh, 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 vegetation there, and uh, people live in huts sometimes in the in, in the villages, and uh, those, those huts are totally different from uh, what we come across uh, in, in in North India, and uh, these things are uh, supposedly uh, are captured by the, the fiction of the land, fiction of the place, because fiction, uh, as we all discussed, uh, is something you know that uh, takes into uh, account the uh, supposedly simple details of life. But actually, those details tell a lot about the deeper layers of uh, an experience. So uh, we have in Kerala then uh, the, the Malayalam language, and uh, Malayalam language and literature are marked by a few things. And these I, you know, start with uh, explaining to you. For instance, uh, uh, Kerala has a very rich heritage of education, educational activity, organized education, the modern organized education uh, as it uh, sp sprang up in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, it was a kind of a movement. In North India, education is a movement only in parts. Maybe in Lahore there was an educational movement, and uh, there would have been in, in Bengal also an educational movement. But the kind of, uh, you know, uh, energy, the kind of passion, the kind of excitement that was there in the stream of education in Kerala is, was in fact unprecedented. Uh, people, you know, uh, gave their life to it. People, you know, moved around. They, they went to different villages. They opened schools and colleges. And uh, they, they opened, you know, for all, uh, you know, people. Not, not just the, uh, you know, uh, uh, privileged, but the, the, the rich people, the people with uh, comforts and facilities, but in the smallest of villages. And uh, this kind of a uh, uh, education that, that, that occurs uh, at the hands of, uh, you know, uh, energetic uh, activists uh, in, in the land, that creates all the difference. And uh, uh, today, I think uh, Kerala is the only uh, place in the in, in the country which has 100% literacy, which is, which is remarkable, you know, in, in terms of uh, educational spread uh, at the world level. So uh, this educational activity, this was there in the uh, earlier part of the 20th century itself, and that education opened doors to a kind of connect that existed within Kerala and uh, connected between Kerala and the rest of the places in India and abroad. So it's that kind of openness that you have in Kerala culture because of the education uh, that, 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 that was given uh, a, a shape of a campaign by, by the great activists. And uh, these activists, you know, uh, would, would uh, work always untired uh, in order to, uh, you know, uh, tell people that this was the basic requirement and I don't have to, you know, wax eloquent about education. All of us are aware that education makes all the difference in modern life. Then second thing is commitment. Uh, already I've suggested that uh, uh, when you uh, spread education, when you go from one place to another, open schools and talk to people, you, you tell them that, you know, that, that, that they require knowledge, then of course your own behavior uh, if, if I am an activist, then my own behavior, uh, spreading the, the message of education uh, across the uh, across the place, 
then you know i am all the time spending uh, to to tell people what is right and what is required and uh, if i am spending all the time then a kind of energy is generated in me and more than energy there is a sense of commitment i know what i want to do and i will do it and if there are hurdles i'll cross them so it's that kind of uh, you know uh, passion that kind of a thing that is found in kerala that people started committing themselves to taking conscious decisions to implement what they thought was required and that that kind of commitment has taken kerala forward and uh, kerala has a very uh, you know uh, curious society they want to learn that they, they want to perform they they want to think they have the courage to think and experiment and this courage to think and experiment plus uh, this this kind of thing has given rise to commitment so they think ideologically they think culturally they think imaginatively they also think politically and uh, i think uh, kerala is one of the most uh, politically aware parts of india and uh, that politics is not confined merely to elections that politics is they are also in the preferences that people make in their careers the uh, preference that people make even in their area of thought which is very personal even in their poetry even in their in their writings uh, outside poetry so that uh, choice that preference that emphasis which commitment gives to uh, you know your your behavior to my behavior that preference is very clearly pronounced in the kerala culture and uh, this has given a committed kind of a writing to uh, kerala uh, through its uh, you know um uh, efforts uh, at implementation by at, at the hands of people so uh commitment all of us understand then intellectual ethos the the, the kerala culture uh the, is, is also having uh, uh, what is what can be called ethos and this ethos is intellectual they of course feel they are also angry they they, they, they protest they, they assert themselves but that assertion and 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 that activism that they have is always informed by intellect they think they analyze they differ with one another they they, they hold you know hot discussions and uh, uh, in discussion you know there's a kind of democracy and that this democracy is at the core of uh, you know uh, discourse and you can see that happening of uh, the i'll be referring to uh, certain stories later uh, short stories uh, with with respect to kerala fiction and then you know i'll not uh, go into the details of the text but i'll tell you uh, with reference to uh, one or two stories that, that 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 i have picked up today for discussion that the uh going on in the, in the story as captured by the two writers that that, that i have taken up two representative writers uh, these you know always uh, compel us to think compel us to go into the nature of the circumstance as to why you know there is inequality why for instance the two people are different and are they re- uh, are they you know uh, living a real life a life of genuine interest or are they living a fake life there is something like like a fake life also we uh, uh, in north india we uh, have a, an idea of what is fake life and what is uh, what is genuine life but the kind of intensity with which this uh, you know view of fake life is uh, you know uh, examined by 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 certain fiction writers is absolutely remarkable and uh, i'll be just referring to that in, in my discussion later and the last and uh, perhaps the most important thing about kerala culture is that it's a matrilineal kind of society it's a society uh, which is based on matriarchy not patriarchy so it's woman centered uh, you know in marriage for instance the the uh, authority is with the girl with the woman with her family and it is through that you know that people function like we have patriarchy in north india and uh, in some parts of uh, uh, we don't have patriarchy as much in uh, uh, the eastern part but so far as the western northern part is concerned the central part is concerned it is totally patriarchal this means that males dominate the, the father figure dominates then the, there is an ishwar uh, in the family that ishwar is the father and uh, everything that that happens in the family or uh, under patriarchy happens always uh, in the un, under the protection of the male but that's not true about kerala so kerala we can learn from kerala i'm not i'm, I'm not saying that matriarchy is a better system or a worse system what i'm saying is it's a different system so uh, this can be seen by by the uh, behavior of kerala women uh, who who are uh, who are 
thinking uh, as, and, and uh, using intellect uh, majorly, uh, unlike their uh, you know uh, other uh, other counterparts elsewhere in the country. So you can see that the dignity, the, the kind of assertion, the kind of confidence that Kerala women would have, and uh, a part of it, a part of the credit for this might go to the uh, matrilineal kind of society that we have there. So these four things, education, uh, commitment, intellectual ethos, and matrilineal structure, these things uh, constitute a, a kind of category of uh, writing uh, which, which gets reflected in literature uh, you know, as something distinct and unique. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there are two writers I'll be taking up. Uh, I'll discuss them in the second part of our lecture. But here I just mentioned these two writers. The first writer I'll, I'll take up will be Muhammad Bashir, Bashir Waikom Muhammad Bashir. And the second writer that I'll take up for, for talking about is M.T. Vasudevan Nair. And I'll be picking up these uh, writers with respect to their short stories. And uh, I've uh, uh, selected Card Sharper's Daughter, a, 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 a story that is there in the courses in, in, in many universities, and M.T. Vasudevan Nair and his story, Bondage. So I'll come to that uh, in the second part of the lecture. But then first, let me raise the issue of a general nature with respect to the fiction in Kerala. Now, now Kerala has a history of fiction. Uh, it, 20th century uh, Kerala is full of uh, fiction. And uh, that fiction is uh, modern in nature. Modern in the Indian sense of the word, not in the sense in which uh, the word is used uh, in, in Europe, for instance, in England, for instance. But in the sense, you know, that uh, Kerala fiction has departed from the ancient, uh, the, the medieval uh, uh, thought process from the 20th century uh, beginning itself. And uh, they uh, felt inspired by uh, what broadly is called in English literature, the Renaissance ethos. What is Renaissance ethos? Uh, there is a kind of a new learning and uh, that learning has the human being at the center of it and the human being is rational, and the human being is understanding and sympathetic, and the human being wants to act in order to uh, change society according to one's own requirements. So this is the kind of Renaissance thought that we have in India, and uh, it is largely inspired by the uh, developments in the West in the uh, 15th, 16th centuries, and from there onwards, you know, in, in Europe, uh, uh, the monarch became important. That monarch then started, you know, deriving a strength from the trading class, and uh, because of which, you know, uh, very soon in the 18th century uh, onwards, uh, in Europe there was rise of capitalism, and capitalism in those days meant that ordinary people would be producing things themselves, taking them them, them to the market, selling and buying them, and they will not be driven by the interests of the church interest of a religious institution, but by the interests of supply and demand. And this kind of a thing uh, uh, was an offshoot of the Renaissance thought, because Renaissance thought always believe in, believed in the centrality of human person as a productive person. And uh, uh, in, in the Renaissance context, productive person doesn't mean a person who just makes this and that thing, but that the person produces on one's own, uh, realizing, you know, that he has to uh, rely on his inner resources, his intellectual resources, and for uh, you know increasing those resources, he would use his mind, and if he uses his mind, then he will he will have a different kind of imagination. He will interact with the world in which he lives. He will interact with the nature that surrounds him. So the human being, <coughs> under uh, the Renaissance thought, will become a self-reliant, self-dependent person. So this kind of you know selfhood, this kind of assertion, this kind of freedom. Uh, that, 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 that you know, human beings get. Uh, that is what Renaissance ethos is. And uh, in India, this came rather late. In the 20th century, you have this kind of a Renaissance. Uh, it has its roots in the, in the 19th century. We have discussed it uh, under this series of lectures also, the same thing. But so far as the uh, kind of uh, ideas are concerned in, the, in today's context, uh, in, 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 the, in this lecture, I would say that Renaissance emerged uh, substantially in the 20th century. And uh, that renaissance, you know, inspired the Kerala fiction a great deal. This is the point I want to make. In Kerala, uh, origin of the writers in the beginning, initially, in the 20th century, they were inspired by the renaissance thought. They wanted to take interest in society. They wanted to take interest in equality. They wanted to, uh, you know, uh, behave as if they were independent human beings. And 
they would not bow uh, you know down easily before the circumstance uh, which they thought was their own creation and not the creation of any godly or religious or, or transcendental authority so this is the kind of uh, thing you know that uh, is seen in kerala fiction and in, in the early kerala fiction you have uh, uh, writers who have looked at their world critically uh, who know you know what, what is going on in their world uh, who are powerful who are weak how the powerful influence the weak how the weak try to resist and they are crushed and in the process a kind of wisdom gets created in the society and writers you know capture that wisdom uh, earn that wisdom win that wisdom and then they express it in literature now i ask a question from you and and, and from myself also if after looking at such a world in which we live uh, we get wisdom then how do we uh, you know write a different kind of literature suppose i know uh, uh, in, in my own world that this is this is how the world operates that this is how the the, the principles of life uh, start governing uh, you know things in uh, in my world then how what kind of literature do i write this is a question you know that that i pose to myself and my answer would be that i would try to imagine characters in the light of what i think about society so i think about society i'm clear about it and uh, i know that uh, this kind of an idea is right and once i get the feel of the right thing the correct thing the, the required thing then i'll start shaping and forming characters according to the requirements of what i think this is what kerala fiction started doing in the 20th century itself so they would uh, you know find society wrong so they would like to attack it they are, they, they would find that this uh, society can go in the right direction only after people understand things so they will start spreading that understanding with the help of the writing and fiction came handy for this they can create characters uh, who will you know argue with others they, they they can create women who will argue with men they can create uh, you know women who will argue with other women uh, who who are supporting men and others so if this kind of a thing is uh, continuously uh, engaged with then you know a different kind of fiction emerges all of us know that uh, in india there is a very long tradition of fiction Uh, long and particularly uh, uh, short but also long we have epics we 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 have dramas with which also have some kind of fiction and we have folk tales and uh, in, from 90th century onwards we also have the printed word so the, so there are there are pieces of fiction there also but then most of the fiction till the early 20th century in india was traditional it it, it always you know uh, 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 emphasized the the value of those ideas which uh, kept society at where it was but so far as kerala fiction is concerned right in the beginning the uh, fiction became critical and the writer started presenting an alternative paradigm to what existed so the writer knew that there was something wrong in society and that wrong could be righted and that uh, a different set of alternatives was to be built therefore the set of ideals compelled them to imagine different kinds of characters different kinds of situations and uh, in the process of doing it they wrote a different kind of fiction so uh, what uh, i'm taking this idea from uh, a scholar uh, pp ravindra he has uh, an introductory uh, piece uh, has uh, you know uh, made this point that the fiction of kerala the early fiction in the 20th century can be called the art of artlessness why art and why artlessness because they are talking about life and 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 in life you you don't see art so when you write fiction that also be very close to life which doesn't have art but then life has energy so that energy should be captured capture the energy uh, think of the ordinary masses think of their dialogues and uh, make them speak the way they generally speak in life so if they speak the same thing in in in, in the realm of culture in in a short story on the page then you know people think that it's just, it's just like what we do therefore the writer gives the impression of being artless he is not creating any art he is not creating anything beautiful or impressive what he is doing is or what she is doing it is just presenting people's ordinariness on the page and that is artlessness but <clears throat> at the same time the person who is presenting it has a view the person who is pre- presenting it is is a conscious person this person is not doing it just because he is he is a mirror and he is just showing the things you know the way they are he is acting as a mirror he is behaving as a mirror but then the mirror is his 
he is the mirror in fact. And if he is the mirror or his writing is a mirror, then he is very intelligently handling, handling this and giving the impression that he is, he is a mirror. Actually, a person who thinks that he is a mirror and uses himself as a mirror is actually not a mirror. That person is using his head, using his mind in order to bring in this kind of an idea. So, this is a this slightly subtle point, but then this is the point that Kerala fiction showed in the early part that they wrote stories that would resemble life in the ordinary and uh, that, that resemblance, you know, gave the impression that they were artless. But they were actually very artful. They were very skilled in, in, in their work. They were very intelligent. They were very critical. They were very creative. And that creativity was hidden. So this is the kind of artlessness that is there in the early part of the Kerala fiction. We will uh, sl slightly explain uh, this, this point further, take it up further and then we can you know, uh, uh, think of uh, the, the kind of fiction that later on emerged out of this artlessness. So with this uh, you know, uh, background with us that we have uh, a different kind of fiction and that fiction has commitment, that fiction has new values and that, uh, that, that fiction initially is so strong that it is uh, uh, covering the ordinary areas of life, giving them the impression of ordinariness, but putting the ordinary at the center of the fictional writing. So this is this I'll explain further, and uh, till the discussion continues later, uh, we let's have a break. Thank you. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for giving us this productive <coughs> session, friends. We will be back after a short break and would be discussing more. So you are requested to be with us. Thank you. Hello friends, welcome back to the session. Friends, as you know that today we are talking on realism in Malayalam fiction and for the discussion on the topic we have with us in our studios, Professor Alan Prakash. Now I would like to welcome our guest, Professor Prakash once again and would request him to continue the lecture further. Hello sir. Well friends, we have uh, already uh, taken up the idea of realism and uh, the first point that I made about it uh, in the context of uh, Kerala fiction was that uh, Realism is something that appears to resemble with reality, but then actually is making us conscious about that reality in a specific manner. And uh, this is what you know has been defined uh, uh, by, by critics as the art of artlessness. And you will see that uh, when people talk, then they are not aware that they are talking beautifully or that they are talking harshly. They are doing it just because this is how they feel. And if the writer is able to present the same view uh, of, of those people on the page, then this writer is actually withdrawing himself to a corner and letting people speak on the, on the page in the short story. So he also uh, gives the impression of uh, literature being exactly like life. But because he is doing it uh, under a purpose, therefore, it is art. And he is uh, with great difficulty, uh, you know, using words that are actually spoken 
He is putting the, those, those words together and he is creating a sense of knowledge through the presentation. So it is art, but it appears to be artless. So this is what uh, uh, people in Kerala, writers in Kerala started doing in the beginning and they were committed uh, writers because of which they wanted to focus upon the importance of ordinary masses not about kings and queens. So you will not, you will not find kings, queens, I mean, are, uh, 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 unless they, you know, in, in a negative light, but then they will show the importance and dignity of the ordinary masses. And this idea came from Europe, it came from the 19th century realist fiction in Europe, uh, in, in, in French fiction for instance, or in English fiction like Charles Dickens, and uh, Kerala people had, uh, you know, uh, seen the virtue of and the strength of European fiction and therefore they started writing like the fiction writers of the West in the 19th century and earlier. Now uh, <clears throat> how this uh, art is uh, you know uh, produced and what is the understanding that works behind it uh, is uh, there in this phrase that I am uh, quoting, placing an abstractly conceived man at the center of the scheme of things. You think of the man, think of the human being, think of the woman for instance and uh, you think in an abstract manner, you think of the idea of the man, idea of the woman and in, after that you give that idea a concrete shape, you make it relevant by presenting a circumstance and thinking of a character. So this is the kind of fiction that is there in Kerala in the early part of the 20th century that already an image is formed of a man in the mind of the writer and that image then is presented in concrete social terms. That is the realist fiction of the Renaissance kind, that is the uh, kind of fiction that is realistic in nature, it is real. Human beings are presented as real, but then before that you have formed an idea about those human beings. Uh, in, in Hindi for instance, Premchand is such a writer, in English uh, Dickens and Hardy were such writers and in Kerala you have people like Bashir who have that idea, they know, you know, that this is how people behave and uh, this is how, uh, you know, the common thread between one person and another can be thought of and uh, keep that common thread in mind and then create a character and that character will be like all others. It will be one character, it will be a different character, but then it will also resemble all others because this is the idea that is now being concretized, idea that is being presented in realistic terms. So this is one thing that uh, is, is uh, explained in this manner and then further the artlessness that I talked about, the artlessness had behind it the conviction that fiction represented a spontaneous and unmediated translation of experience. Unmediated translation of experience, what is unmediated? Unmediated means that the writer did not put anything from his own side, he did not mediate, he did not mix anything of his own uh, in the description that he gave and he gave a pure experience and that unmediated thing that then appeals to the masses because they think that it is not mixed, it is pure, it is like us. So I repeat the quotation, the artlessness had behind it the conviction that fiction represented a spontaneous and unmediated translation of experience from the worldly to that of the literary. So well you lift things from the world, you put them into literature, do not try to mix anything, do not try to change anything uh, so that it appears strange, it appears better or worse, but that it appears like what it was in life. This is the kind of writing that Kerala gave and uh, I believe uh, very few writers in India have done this kind of a skill, use this kind of a skill to write because this requires a lot of effort. You have to know the village, you have to know the small town, you have to know the, the, the big town, you have to know the connection between the village and the big town and sometimes you can assume the posture of a person who lives in the town sometimes or the village. Now all these things and yet you know uh, appearing to be artless is something remarkable and Kerala fiction has this character that just like life, so in literature but make it literature. You do not have to go to life, in life in fact if you, if you move around in life you would not see all those things which are ordinary, you will just do your work and come back. But when you think about it uh, through a writing, then of course you know that oh, okay I saw it, it is exactly like that but now I can understand 
why or how it goes on. This is the kind of artlessness that the uh, Kerala fiction at that point of time, uh, you know, exercised. <coughs> the example uh, is, uh, uh, of, of uh, this kind of uh, fiction, it's, a, it's, a, it's called great fiction, great realistic fiction. This example uh, can be strengthened by a quotation <coughs> that uh, uh, is there uh, with us. And uh, <coughs> Flaubert, <coughs> the 19th century French writer, and he was a great short story writer also, a great novelist. He wrote that famous novel, Madame Bovary. And this person said something very interesting. <coughs> and uh, let me read this out. Read this out. Flaubert <coughs> had once drawn a parallel between the artist and God. Who is like an artist? Uh, now, artist is like who? God. You have, the, you have God who creates. You also have an artist who creates. Okay. Uh, between the artist and God, the supreme creator and had suggested, Flaubert had suggested, that like the Almighty, the artist in his creation should never become visible. You know that uh, uh, if you believe in God, then, then you can uh, you know, use this kind of an idea that uh, we do, you don't see God, you, call, you see human beings. And who created human beings? God himself created. But when you meet a human being, you, 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 now, you are never aware. You are never conscious that you are meeting uh, a part of God through the human being. Like the Almighty, the artist in his creation should never become visible, but should make sure that the work is animated by the author's unseen presence. It's a slightly abstract idea, but it's a very interesting idea that human beings are creations of God, so they must be carrying some part of God in themselves. Do we know it? Do we see it? Do we see God in human beings? Now, let, let's take the metaphor back to the writing. You create, you, you write a novel, you write a short story, there you put characters. And uh, who has put characters there? You have put characters there as a writer. But the, when the reader reads, he does not see you in the short story, see in the novel. What, what does he see is the actual people there. So it's a, it's a very good way of saying, you know, that the writer should never appear to be present in one story, but he's always present. This is what Kerala fiction is of the earlier period. And uh, this kind of Kerala fiction, uh, you know, uh, ruled the roost for a long time. Till, let's say, when, uh, till the country became free, till 1947, till 1950. These people were writing all the time. And they were not one. They were 10, 15, 20 people. In, in, in other languages, like in, in, uh, in, in, in Bangla, of course, there are a large number of writers. But in Hindi, there are very few writers. And all those writers uh, who wrote in this way uh, were writing before independence, but they were not as powerful as they were in Kerala, apart from, uh, you know, exceptions. So, uh, so far as Kerala writing is concerned, this kind of realism is the mainstay there, is, 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 is the staple there. They have this writing. So, you read this writing and in fact you are transported to the early years of 20th century in Kerala. And there you can understand what Kerala is, uh, you know, uh, brimming with, or what Kerala is full of. And uh, you read that fiction and in fact you have already understood the central truth of Kerala experience. So this is the kind of thing that is there. And uh, we, uh, I, I, when I thought of this idea regarding Kerala, then uh, one particular writer who came to mind uh, was Muhammad Bashir, Vaikom Muhammad Bashir. Uh, the, the story that I, I have referred to in the uh, first part of the lecture, uh, this story uh, I can take up in, well, not exactly detail, but I can uh, uh, talk about a few things. When Muhammad Bashir writes, he always has the plan in his mind and he seems to be the master of the situation. And he is such a natural master of the situation because of his realism that he can create tremendous sense of humor. He can create jokes, you know, and in such a manner that you completely forget that you are, you are, you are reading uh, about society. You are, and and you, your mind is stirred, you are, you are, you are, your mind is excited. You start thinking of so many things and uh, he is very teasing. Just because he has complete mastery over his, uh, you know, understanding of society, he, he understands society so well that you know he can he can confidently talk about and with with, with you know great uh, uh, courage and with, with great conviction he can talk about the characters and situations. Uh, this card sharper's daughter. Now imagine the the, 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 the daughter is the uh, uh, seen as <coughs> uh, a person. 
uh, you know, who, who is uh, opposed by her father. And it's a kind of a clash between the daughter and the father. But the, uh, but the, the author is uh, referring to the father, but is focusing upon the daughter. And how does the story begin? And what does the story say? The writer will not tell. The writer is merely uh, regaling us. The writer is merely entertaining us. And uh, in fact, when I started reading the story, I thought he was not talking about any, any society at all. He was doing something very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, interesting and uh, uh, teasing. See this story, the beginning, the first uh, two sentences, three sentences of the story, they will tell you the style that the author is using. It's a realistic style, more than realistic in fact. And uh, le let me just read out the few sentences in the beginning of the story. He starts by saying, the moral of the story may as well be delivered right at the beginning. Generally, moral of the story is given at the end. You just uh, tell a tale, you just, just talk about things. But at the end, you say, okay, now learn this from what I had to uh, write. And he says, girls will find it neither amusing nor enlightening. They will not like my story, but I have to tell the moral in the beginning. Why is he teasing these girls, the, 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 the uh, uh, girls among readers? Girls will find it neither amusing nor enlightening. Anyway, here it is. And then the sentence is given. If you happen to have daughters, steal your heart and murder them all in cold blood. This is the moral of the story. And then, you know, so now that you are sufficiently shocked, then he explains what he means. He says, now don't think that these are my views. I earnestly hope and pray that none of the many honorable ladies among my readers, incensed, that is angered, incensed by this blatantly misogynist observation, see his language, and this is translation language. Misogynist is anti-woman, and observation is his thought. I read again. Now, don't think that these are my views. I earnestly hope and pray that none of the many honorable ladies among my readers incensed by this blatantly misogynist observation, condemns me to eternal damnation. He is also uh, somehow uh, teasing the readers of literature. Do you know whose language it is generally? At the back of this language is the language of Milton. And Milton uh, ta talks about uh, Satan in Paradise Lost. So he is using those words, and he, which means that he is also teasing the literary reader. Uh, incensed by this blatantly misogynist observation, condemns me to eternal damnation. They should start this person, poker, instead. They should target poker instead. So, uh, what does uh, Muhammad Bashir say then? He says that he is going to tell a story, and uh, he is a storyteller himself. And when he tells the story, then there is a character in it, the father, this card sharper, whose idea is that women are always troublemakers. And then the story begins. What is the story about? The story is about the revolt of the daughter against her father. And uh, the, the father doesn't like it. He has a plan for his daughter. He wants to marry her off you know, uh, 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 in such a way that finally she, she, she remains comfortably in life. But the daughter has other plans. The daughter is an independent woman. She is a woman of Kerala. She wants a particular person. And uh, that person is not a very good one. But, 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 but what can one do? This is what the girl wants. Therefore, she will have her way. She will have her victory. And she will ensure, you know, that the father is not allowed to disturb her plans. So the moment you read such a story, what do you, what do you find in it? How do you feel about such a story? And the story is long. And uh, the, the, she will pick up a character. Or she will pick up a person. Um, she will marry him. She will make a fool of her father. And that person is, 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 a, is not an exactly a good person, he is a pickpocket, but then he has his own plans. Why is the writer taking up these characters in the first instance, if it is a realistic story? Because this is what people in the city have, this is what people in the small towns have. They have these people and the writer is saying that they have, they have no particular uh, you know, uh, life fulfilling plans or, or, or schemes that they can do. It is a poor country. It's a country of unequals, and in that such characters appear. And uh, 
these characters also very interesting. So just see that uh, it's a very interesting story. It's a story which inspires thought, and you start wondering as to what kind of place Kerala is, and you realize that illiterate ones also have the, a mind of their own, and they fight. And when they fight, they experiment and 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 they think quite a lot. They plan, they scheme, they they uh, they have very intelligent dialogues, and and those dialogues you know cut across uh, other dialogues and. then the drama is created so this kind of a drama is possible only because the story is at the core realistic this this this, this is the point i am making so in card sharper's daughter the writer has complete command over the story he he picks up characters presents them in a certain manner and he'll carry it through he is not disturbing the characters he is just allowing them to behave in their own uh, you know manner and uh, at the end the story will finally emerge as something a tale of happiness you will find that the woman will be happy the, the father himself will be happy the, the lover who becomes the husband is also happy and in the meantime the writer would have given a picture of the story as a whole this is the kind of story that uh, kerala fiction uh, you know constitutes uh, the, the kerala fiction uh, is uh, highly imaginative is highly experimentative uh, it, it, it energizes it, it, it teases you it inspires you it excites your imagination it makes you think so the writer is not offering any answers the writer is telling a tale but the tale is imbued with this kind of humor this kind of wit this kind of you know a play on the words that uh, you cannot take away from you have to take your attention away from the uh, details of of the, of the story however hard you may try so this is realistic fiction and it's very difficult to uh, actually counter the effect of such a story by other people who don't agree with you so realistic fiction has this quality and kerala's fiction and see the humor here right in the beginning and he is uh, teasing the uh, all, uh, this reader he he is uh, you know uh, somehow uh, creating a sense of suspense and at the same time he has the answer so he's a, he's a kind of a magician on the stage so he is creating you know he is uh, waving the uh, this uh, magician's wand and uh, he is uh, giving you uh, new ideas and and he is making you smile and and you you start guessing as to how all the story will end and then he will uh, like a great uh, storyteller the master storyteller he will come to the right kind of conclusion so this is the kind of writer that uh, kerala has produced in the early part of the 20th century and uh, then you know the, the, this person was a rage uh, among readers of of literature and uh, you can read more stories by him uh, for, from uh, the books that are available uh, in, in translation he is there now in the many of his stories have already appeared in english translation so you can take up mohammad bashir as a writer and start reading him in light of the comments that i have made the other uh, <coughs> author uh, that comes after bashir and belongs to a different generation immediately following uh, bashir's generation he is a realist but he is a realist of a different kind why can realism be of two kinds three kinds 10 kinds this is the question once again that that, that came we might you know raise uh, might be raised uh, by by us what kind of realism means that there are many kinds of realism and yes that is right there are many kinds of realism one realism is where you just talk as if you have seen the reality and you are not mixing anything with it what i called unmediated but there can be realities also which can be mediated you bring your own experience you mix your own experience with it you can also problematize create a problem make people aware of the problem and then forget then come to the conclusion then stop stop in the middle let people think this all this is a different kind of a thing and early realists would not like it you know uh, renaissance writers have their preferences but if uh, their principles uh, working behind the preferences if those those principles are flouted then they would say they are uh, the, the writer is not a realistic writer but then people like mt vasudev nayar they emerged on the scene in the 1950s 60s and uh, he was there around till the other day then you know people can say okay you wrote your kind of realism when you lived and talked i am writing another kind of realism <coughs> after you i i have read you but then i will create things of my 
on, uh, in, in my own way. So this is uh, what uh, Vasudevan Nair is doing, and uh, I'll take up a story by him uh, 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 in this discussion, and then see. Uh, I'm making some points regarding that story. There is a story uh, titled Bondage. You know the meaning of bondage, and, and Vasudevan Nair is uh, also giving uh, very, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of titles uh, to his stories. Uh, I, I, I was just having a look at the titles, specific titles of his uh, uh, stories and, and, and novellas, short novels. For instance, uh, he was uh, talking about uh, bondage, I know, about uh, bondage, uh, I'm going to discuss. Then the other story is Deluge. So bondage, he is not making clear as to what exactly uh, is he saying. What kind of bondage? Who is binding you? Who is bond binding me? And uh, is, is the binding strong enough? Is, is, is the binding uh, creating you know problems for my freedom? Then there is deluge. What does deluge mean? Is it just the flood or something else? But then there are other indicating titles. You can you can call them great indicators. I mean, one title uh, I would like to think about and will not come to any conclusion for some time. For instance. Mist and the soul of darkness. Why is the writer very sad? Is the writer not finding answers? Is he a different kind of a realist? Realist writer would understand society, will have his wisdom, and according to wisdom, he will create his writing. But here, there is a realistic writer who doesn't seem to have answers, who tries trying to understand the world but, but is not able to succeed. He cannot say what exactly is wrong with the world, and therefore, he will say, I see mist all around me. I can't see things clearly. It's, it's a foggy world. The, 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 there is light, but apart from the light, there is also something else. So I can't see clearly in this world. So he gives that word mist for this. And soul of darkness. Darkness is blankness. Darkness is when you can't see anything. But does, does the soul live in darkness? What kind of a title is this? So uh, Nair is giving this kind of a title, which means that he is perhaps talking about the world which he cannot understand. But he can understand one thing, that this is the world that is dark. This is the world that is mysterious. This is the world that is threatening him. This is a, the world that, if not threatening him, at least is disturbing him. So he, he can't, can't forget it. He can't put it aside and say, this world does not exist. What he will say is, this is a world, I confront it, I can't make sense of it, but it disturbs me and I'm unhappy. So that kind of a writing, what will you call? Will you call it realistic or no? Viewers, think about it because uh, this kind of a writing may or may not be called realistic. But I believe that if there is a writer, at a time he thinks that he can't understand the world and he feels unhappy, then that unhappiness is real and therefore you should share it. So you should create conditions and those conditions you can't easily see and they are not there actually, but he will mix things, he will be mediating. I said that the earlier uh, realistic fiction in Kerala was unmediated. They did not mix anything with it. But now the, the writer is mediating. He is telling you that this thing he doesn't like. So if he doesn't like, then that dislike also is a kind of reality and he is sharing that reality with us in such a manner that this appeals to us. So uh, I am posing the question, if you feel something, is that feeling real? Should you, sh should you share that feeling with the people? If you share it, will you call, call it valuable? These are the questions. I don't, I don't want to uh, give any answers to this, but I say that there is one kind of realism which says this is how the world is. Now think of the alternative, change it. Or at least if you cannot change it, uh, you, you, you can always see that this, this paradigm uh, should be uh, looked forward to. But here is a writer who says, I'm confused, I'm pained, I'm disgusted, I'm feeling helpless and my helplessness, my pain, my disgust is real and I want to share this with you. My question is, if you share this with, the, with, 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 with if, if you have this view, then should you or should you not share with it? Is that not realistic? This is the question I pose. But then, uh, in, in the light of this, let's have a look at the story. And the story, as I, as I already said, is bondage. <coughs> What kind of bondage is this? There is a man who is successful. He has lived in Kerala, but he married in a family uh, where you know he is uh, the outsider. 
it's a material uh, it's a, it's a matriarchal society so he married a, he married a woman he also got uh, the the money from the from the uh, father but as a but, but as a son in law and the son in law lives there and the the owner is the mother is is, is the wife and uh, he has uh, married her he doesn't seem to be happy there in that situation where where, where he he is he is second rate uh, in a family because everything belongs to the father of the girl not he and because it is the father's money therefore it's the girl's money and uh, the girl uh, the, the the woman is not headstrong in this particular story she is very nice and she is illiterate she is semi illiterate she doesn't understand him and this man is very intelligent the master the woman is semi illiterate and is a simple soul and uh, the, the the husband uh, is intelligent but he is dependent on her therefore he goes to the city and there he assumes a different kind of a role he has a mistress he has he has a beloved and he doesn't tell her that, that that he is married he gives the impression to the woman that he is he is he is not married and one day he is going to propose to her but before he proposes to her he might propose to her he starts living with her he is enjoying his time there her company and uh, sometimes he comes back to the village and there he says well he is working there and is very busy he can't come back so he comes very rarely to the village but all the time he is uh, you know concocting he he is all the time you know inventing excuses to remain away from his home in the village is he uh, is he such a person leading a life of uh, imprisonment that he is imprisoned in the family uh, because his, his his wife is actually uh, the master or he is he is living in the city where the city is all the time capturing him where is he what is he doing so the is he not bound by this and that world is he not living in a state of bondage this is the question that the writer is posing and i just uh, quote the last sentence and finish the discussion today from one prison camp to another one prison camp is in the village the other prison camp is in the city so there is a beloved on one side there is a woman on the other he has not promised anything to anybody and he doesn't know what to do this is the kind of bondage and the writer is posing a question i i believe that this is a realistic story and therefore kerala is kerala fiction is problematizing the reality of its period thank you with this note thank you so thank you so very much for giving us this uh, productive session on realism in malayalam fiction dear friends if you have any queries or feedback then do write to us at info.ce@nic.in as well as you can write your questions suggestions your feedbacks are all welcome over here so friends we would be meeting again very soon and would be discussing more under this particular series so then take care goodbye thank you so thank you once again